How about some pickups from the last time we were here together in St. Paul's? I mean, here. I don't care when anybody says St. Paul's, it's always confusion, I know, like you, is whether they're going to make some reference to the Pope or to Johnny Cash's nice song, Big River. But if you recall, we were, <clears throat> I met her accidentally in St. Paul. Did the Pope record that too? I met her accidentally in St. Paul, Minnesota. Well, it's just that Cash's songs has gotten so popular in the last few years. If you recall the last thing, we were talking about the... We were talking about the possible ramifications of several areas that I wanted to pick up that we didn't finish. One was if we temporarily accepted the claim that in some way there have been primates that were humanly, <coughs> comma, lab taught to damn near engage in human speech. And a possible ramifications a little bit further having to do with sort of a bro broader area of, quote, natural abilities as opposed to acquired, learned abilities, which of course this would certainly be if indeed primates somewhere had been taught something resembling abstract symbolic communica communication sufficient to even be spoken seriously in a verbal context of it approaching human communication, human speech, whether they're actually making vocal sounds or not, you understand, this kind of unnatural, abstract, malleable communication between two species, which would be a learned ability as, acquired, as opposed to a natural one. Well, a few little things I wanted to pick up, if you would consider a further pondering in this area. That again, just for the moment, accepting that this is true, that there's some validity, then consider this. If we had another species, a chimpanzee, if he did acquire this talking ability. Let's just assume that in some way he has. Note this. It would not do him one iota of good in two respects. Outside the lab and away from those who taught him. Now, if indeed we're still accepting that they have done this in some way. That's not, I just want you, we're not debating that but it has to do with something else. If, if, if this has been done, you do understand if they turn this chimpanzee loose and in some way he is now through mashing buttons or whatever the latest gimmick method is, that he in some way can put together words that he's been taught and symbols and actually make new sentences. In other words, he is doing something that is an acquired ability, something that would have never come natural in a species on this planet as far as they can tell outside of man. And that he has learned to put together that he can mash buttons now and they can change around the game or whatever it is, game bananas or whatever the fun is, and he can now, he has to construct a sentence and put verbs in some sort of order in relationship to the nouns and the object, and that a that chimp can learn to do it and seem to have some idea of what's going on. It's the basis that they keep trying to hit. If that were true, let's just assume it is, do you understand, literally, I'm not trying to prove a point here. There's something else. We're not trying, we're not arguing with psychology. If that were true, that would be, as they keep on to claim, a wondrous breakthrough, right? In the city, somebody's going to make a hell of a reputation in psychology or zoology. Somebody is really going to get on some sort of academic, if not fiscal gravy train, make a name for themselves, and et cetera. The chimp will probably become famous. But now think, outside the context of where it was taught this new ability, this learned talent, it would not do one, not even the slightest bit of good. In other words, turn that chimpanzee loose back in the wilds, and what good would this do him? I mean, there's no shadings, there's no way to think of decimal points. Zilch. None. None, 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 none. I surely you see that. If he is down to the point, this chimp, that he can put together a new sentence and just do things that there in the lab, in front of the press, 
God, the Nobel Committee, another psychologist and zoologist, that he can now seem to put together abstract ideas in new ways, take symbols, and he can do this, and he is down there close if he had the vocal ability. But other than that, he is just operationally just right at the level of human communication. And then you turn him loose in the wilds, back amongst his own. What good would it do him? I mean, there's nothing to think about about, well, it could possibly. No, there's no possibly. There's nowhere to look. It would do him no good. None. I'm not saying we'd be any worse off. But no good whatsoever. Not even the teensiest, weensiest. Little poquita of it. None. Now, since we're still not to the point, really, could you in any way try and connect that reality, that fact, to a consideration of how man's ordinary intellect looks upon itself? Man's ordinary intellect looks upon itself in a certain way, without having to describe it this manner, looks upon itself as having taught itself. Now, if it was pushed a little bit, man's, your ordinary intellect might want to say, all right, I have been taught, and I have been taught by me and my environment, which you cannot separate. But in one sense, when you, without trying to play some psychological or verbal game and argue about it, there is a quite valid way in which to consider and even speak of the intellect thinking about it having taught itself. Now, I know you had teachers, and I know you went to school, and I know you read books, but what good did it do unless this thing was like standing guard, unless you were giving it your attention, unless you were interested in what the course was going on, and unless you were hungry for the information. So in one real sense, and the libraries are down the street corners, paid for by taxes. You can go in and get books for no cost. Check them out. Teach yourself all everything from shoe repair to brain surgery. But everyone doesn't do that. So the information is there. The apparent instructions are available. And so in one real sense, people, without thinking about it in this way, and I'm not trying to prove that in some way I'm correct, but I just want you to see, in a way that's not normally discussed, the intellect really assumes that it has taught itself. There's no real word for this, as I said, because you never thought about it this way. It doesn't say, well, yeah, I taught myself, because then it would say, well, that's silly, which it sort of is. But it's like that the information, my instructions, in some way have been humanly taught. I have been lab trained here. That what I know did not come from Harvard, did not come from classrooms in Princeton, did not come from books that I was physically reading there in the public room of the library. The information away was there, kind of like the environment's there, but the environment's not me, ordinary intellect says. I'm a part of it. I'm connected to it, and I need the environment. I need sunshine and water and et cetera. But... The dynamo, the engine that runs me, is me. And other times, other places, I'm referred to as the, the godly spark of life or one soul, one spirit. But now take it back to a strictly, as much as we can talk about in this unusual manner, the intellectual development. And one, in a sense, is playing a kind of concept of a different species being taught in a way that's damn near unnatural. That this thing has been learned to, been taught to talk. Close. That I can almost communicate with me, I can almost communicate with other people. And all we're doing is changing it from this chimpanzee over here can almost communicate with us. There is a certain way, I'm not going to stay, you just either got to see it or not, there's a certain way that it is quite functional functionally correct to say that the intellect looks upon its source of instruction. If not the source, an inescapable part. So I'd have to get going, but it's actually, it looks at itself as being the funnel, the doorway, the source of instruction. 
that I, in a sense, have taught myself. Had it not been for me, I wouldn't know anything. Had it not been for me, I couldn't talk. Had it not been for me, I would not know what I know. I had some great teachers, blah, 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 and I read some great books. But still, had it not been for me, I would not have what I have. Now back to what I pointed out. What would this say about the fact that whatever anyone knows serves them no good once you're away from those who taught you? Huh. Is that dirty enough just to stop there? It looks like we just stopped there. I'll repeat it one more time if I have to play the Geesenslaw brothers. Keep repeating the punchline to somebody who laughs. In the sense that the intellect ordinarily sort of perceives of itself as having taught itself, that in some way I have been my own source of instruction. I've been an inescapable, irreplaceable part. But in a sense, this has instructed itself that I have mentally pulled myself, everyone has, up by my own bootstraps. Write that down. But now back to what I pointed out about the chimp. I assume you can see that if that chimp can play with these, whatever machine, whatever he can do that's astounding and might get him, uh, the closing minutes if they could ever dig Ed Sullivan back up and tell whether he was alive or not and put the show back on there, he might close the show. Great act. But you take that same chimp and put him back in the forest, back in his natural environment, natural environment, and what he has learned will serve him not one iota of good. Not one little bit will it help. Now back to, if you can see in a sense, that this, at the ordinary level, has been its own source of instruction. Then I ask you, can you in any way tie that to the fact that anything that is known from any ordinary method, if the recipient of the knowledge, of the instruction, is removed from the source of instruction, the knowledge is useless. I just reversed the way I first put it, sort of. I didn't lose it, though. Well, even if I didn't, then if you were within your ordinary senses, you could say, all right, I followed that, but what in the hell use is that? <laughs> well, let's consider it a little bit more. How about a what if? What if there is some way there is some subversive way if there is some normally unchartered place in the neural system of man wherein a we'll still have to leave it in quotation marks not to be coy but because we're speaking in a relative manner but that there might be some subversive way in which there might be some normally unnoticed neurological area wherein and Acquired ability might be superior to a natural one. Yeah. Does everybody want to play that for a minute? Okay. This on top of me pointing out that if a chimp could acquire a new ability that was unnatural, of how it could make he, him, and his trainer, and his teacher famous, and yet put back in his natural environment away from those who taught him it would serve him no good be useless then how could that possibly be tied to the fact of me asking is it also possible that there is some way in which some place in which in the human nervous system that if it is indeed it is possible to acquire a talent is separate from some natural talent that the acquired one might then be superior Based upon the rounding, resounding reception of that, then how about even another what if? What if? For an intellectual revolutionist, what if for somebody trying to do something out of the ordinary, what if it is only an acquired talent that's even worthy of the name?
The man down in the full amen corner, right down there, says it's beginning to make even less and less sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, how about this? Would you care to try and tie any of this or all of this or some portion from column A into the previous idea that we noted of how this sort of activity, being able to get outside the normal bounds of polarized thought, might be described as being able to intellectually start all over? That doesn't help. The possibility that there could be a way in which an acquired talent, a learned ability, could be superior to a natural one. Because if I wanted to stop long enough, surely your own brain can do it right away. There should be some kind of natural, automatic, intellectual reaction to go, oh no, now wait a minute, wait a minute. There might be some validity to the idea that you can learn something new. There might be some modicum of freedom away from the genetic hold that seems to grip us all, blah, blah. And so it might be possible a person could acquire some new ability outside predestination of genes. But even if they could, and it might be interesting, like a chimp talking, or I might could, through some great extreme effort, learn to play some of the simpler Mozart pieces in such a way that people no longer try and break my fingers as they used to. I still can't make a living, but I have progressed to the point that some people who do not have much music appreciation will stay in the same room with me for up to five minutes. You could say, all right, that's an interesting hobby. I have really enjoyed doing it. But then to carry it to the point that I was asking you to consider, is it possible that there is some way in which, some place in the human nervous system wherein a learned ability, if there be such a thing, an acquired talent could be superior. And the reason I started this is your automatic, the just ordinary level of your own intelligence should immediately oppose that. That no, you could, you could, if you can learn something new, it might be interesting, it might be fun, it might be profitable, but wait a minute, your immediate reaction should be to say that it might be superior, that sounds highly questionable. Now the same to you. What if, not just equal to, not just interesting, not just profitable, what if in some way, in some place, acquired abilities, learned talents, for the kind of subversive purposes of escaping your old ordinary neural building site, what if it's only something you've acquired, only something you've learned, only something unnatural that's even worthy of being called a talent, an ability. And of course, we're not talking about flying through the air and walking on the water and being able to pay all your taxes on time. We're not talking about that kind of spiritual, mystical dream world. We're talking about intellectually, intellectually. Is it possible that that which you could learn that's unnatural to you, it might be unnatural to everyone in your immediate environment, it might be unnatural to your time and place, but that you could learn or find a place that you could think in such a way that was unnatural, which right away should give you some suspicion if you're ordinary. You're ordinary enough, that's why you look suspicious, sir. But what if it's not just, wait a minute, that's highly suspicious. Wait a minute, that is open... I don't even like the sound of that, prima facie. What if it's beyond prima and your facie? And what if it's actually superior for certain purposes? That only talents, only something that you might acquire or learn to do unnaturally is even worthy of your attention, even worthy of being called a talent, an ability. And of course, if it's unnatural, you're not going to tell anybody, so you can't go bragging about it. But to you, to the revolutionists, what if it's only something that you acquired, only something that you could learn, assuming it's true, possible that you can, that only be that would even be worthy of the name, talent, or the description, ability. Well, 
Well, I can see we wrap that up. Because I know there's a certain limited interest in talking about primates. Well, many people get, I don't know, they get kind of agitated when you talk too much about other species, like especially something that's genetically as close as chimps or orangutans, and you talk about them too long or you begin to talk about them in sort of favorable ways or you begin to even insinuate that they might have, oh, I don't know, certain potential abilities close to, what do you call it, humans. I don't know, some people seem to, they seem to have a low threshold of interest in such affairs. I don't know why. Of course, I do know why, but I, I rub it in. Well, let's pretend to change, that we have wrapped that up now is going to change the subject sort of. Considering the ordinary workings of a literal mind in the polarized world of the literal mind sans any sort of unnatural analyzation, the conclusions seem to spell success. That that would seem to be what the mind is after. That would seem to be what civilized intellect. That would seem to be the whole purpose of thought is to reach conclusions, technically, scientifically, theoretically, artistically, philosophically. Conclusions would seem to be that which is, would spell success. And yet, it is the lack of conclusions, the lack of certainty, the lack of finality that in fact keeps the ordinary intellect, the literal mind, on the road to success. It's always nice to go into a simpler, a kindler and gentler area. <laughs> well, let's, let's just make sure, at least verbally to start with, that you got the setup before we get to the punchline. Except <laughs> when it's good, the punchline is the setup. But some of you are supposed to already know that. That's why you can think about something real fast. Sometimes you can think about like a pre-echo on a record or a tape, and then you don't even have to think about it. Oh, yeah. Because then to actually think about it is redundant. <laughs> And as many of you car aficionados know, it is as hard to get parts for redundant as it is as a Studebaker. But conclusions, we could describe it in other ways, which is the other side. But conclusions would seem to be the spelling of success. If Whatever the field, if you're going to think, the linear mind, the ordinary polarized running of energy through the human nervous system resulting in this area up here called, do you know what? Having activities known as you know what? Then success would seem to be, without any doubt, spelled, although we could call it other things, this is a good route, this is a good working definitions of the purpose of this, or the way to judge its success, is by conclusions. Everything from, all right, two and two. We've got to figure out what two and two, and you finally get it worked out, and you whipped out, and you get it down by God, and it turns out to be four. Or you figure out what it is that causes the T2000 transmission in General Motors cars through such and such years. Or you ask, what is the nature of life? Why is it that women think that I am extremely it would seem that the whole purpose or the working definition of how this thing is successful is in any given time, under any conditions, it can reach a conclusion. And if we just stop there, then so be it. It would be a fine working definition. And that's the only way that cars work, electricity works, these tapes work. It's the only way that you can say that you talk. You could talk, but you wouldn't be talking unless you could say that you could talk. You understand? So you'd already had to come to the conclusion about what is talk, what is words, and somebody else has to go, oh, I know what you mean, and then you got somewhere. I'm talking. They go, I got you. You are. 
it would have to come to a conclusion. That would spell success. Comma. And yet, it is the very lack of conclusions. It is the lack of any finality. It is the lack of any stable, unchangeable certainty in the secondary world of the mind that keeps it being successful. Yeah, but it can't be both. That's what he said. And that's why he's sitting there. Well, consider it. We could play the polarized game back on itself. You could say then it would be the linear mind versus the, how about the Klein bottle mind? The Klein mind. That's it. You remember the Klein bottle, except there would be a variation. The linear mind versus the Klein mind. K-L-E-I-N, K-L-E-I-N. The Klein mind, based upon the Klein bottle. Everyone's favorite. Well, I know some of you prefer old granddad. But. <laughs> the Klein bottle, except in this case, it would not be simply, it would not be simply the Klein bottle in the sense that something would seamlessly turn back on itself which topographically is what they're using by you know, the Mobius strip and the Klein bottle. It would not be this. It would be like the spiraling. We'll get it right. The literal mind versus the spiraling Klein mind. Now, by God, write that down. The literal mind versus the spiraling Klein mind, as in the Klein bottle. But not a seamless turning back on itself, which is what the ordinary mind does. It would be a moving beyond all opposition, beyond all this or that. It would be taking ideas such as conclusions, merry-go-rounds, cul-de-sacs, and running them to non-seamless, dizzying new dimensions. That would be like a spiral inclined mind, wherein the lack of conclusions at that point in that sense, would not be failure. I'll refer you then to a Cairo tonight. Did no one like the one that said, if you know where your thinking is headed, it's not headed anywhere? Which, of course, at the ordinary level it is, because you are after at the ordinary level as you should be. You're after a conclusion. No one would sit around and apparently be working on the problem of two and two equals what? And if you had no idea, if, if somebody said that was what they were working on, and you said, well, in what general area do you think that, you're, that you will end up? Where do you think this is going to lead? And the person says, well, I have no doubt it's going to tell me, reveal something new about the uh, genetic workings of sweet peas, if not little monks. You think, well, no, you know, this is probably not going to work out in your favor. If you're trying to, if you think that the, that the problem that you're trying to reach a conclusion about, or about which you're trying to reach a conclusion, starts off that two and two equals that that's a setup. If you're thinking the punchline is going to be somewhere in the area of Jesuit monks playing either the piano or with sweet peas, then I don't think that you are really on the road to success. You understand? In other words, you have got to have some notion that my thinking is leading in some direction or you would not even have the possibility at the ordinary level of being successful. And yet, from a more subversive view, if you have real, a real conviction, as you should, now remember at the ordinary level, if you know, if you just know because it's just reasonable that any other possibility is insane, to say, well, I'm thinking about a, the problem seems to be mathematical. Two plus two, I've been trying to figure it out. And uh, as far as I know, it's going to end up somewhere, without any doubt, in the field of zoology. <laughs> then just at any ordinary level, you'd know that's insane. And with all, you would have to say, if you're the ordinary intelligence, you'd say, well, wait a minute. The only reason that I would try and think about anything, the only reason that any sane person would think about anything, their conclusion I may not know the exact answer. I don't know what two and two is going to equal. 
but I know where it's headed. That is, I know it's running along mathematical paths of inquiry. But, and that's true, that's correct, blah, blah, God bless you, call in. But, from a more subversive view, if you know where your thinking's headed, it's headed nowhere. Because it doesn't matter where you get at the ordinary level of some conclusion, like, wait, we do have it, two and two is four. Made a name for yourself. You and the guy that taught the chimp to talk and start an act. You have been successful. You reached a useful, operational, three-dimensional conclusion. But if you're trying to think, if you're trying to do something beyond polarized neural energy in a 3D context, then we're back to, we're back to this, that if you have some notion, if you know where your thinking is headed, where it's leading, then it's headed, it's leading nowhere. You simply cannot do that. And there's no way to tell somebody, although I just said it, you cannot do that. You can't tell somebody, wait a minute, start thinking. You want to know some great secret? And they go, yeah, now i got a few minutes, what is it? And you say, well, if you want to do something weird, if you want to do something even worthwhile, something astounding, something fun, okay, all right, hurry up, what? All right, try and think in such a way that you don't know where your thinking's going. And if I may do an imitation, they're going to go, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in a bigger hurry than I thought. You know, I'll, maybe I'll catch you later. To say, to be kind about it, it's insane. And you can't tell somebody to do it. You could not even tell yourself. Well, I don't talk to myself anyway. Well, who taught you to think? You mean you're back to that again? You said you changed the subject. I lied. All right? I lost it. Well. If you know where your thinking's going, and you don't have to worry now about words or energy if you get better here in the last few minutes, as you're always supposed to do. <laughs> so you have to run faster right at the end. If you get better, then you understand that it doesn't matter what you're thinking about, and it doesn't matter that you're trying to reach some conclusion. There is no way to prove this. There's no way to say, well, now, if you want to think in a new way, or in a way that's different, better, just different, you've got to think in such a way that's leading nowhere. You can't even do it. I mean, it's tantamount to saying, all right, here's the trick. It's whatever you do, do not think of yams. And then, by God, you know what will happen there. You know what will happen. You know, it's you know, sweet potatoes on the mind. You cannot tell somebody, think in such a way that you do not know where it's headed. Because then they say, wait a minute, all right, the purpose is I'm going to try to think in such a way. No, nah, see, there you go. So you can't talk about it, even though I try. You didn't say fail. All right, even though I try and fail. Are you happy? Wait a minute. Maybe I don't fail. Maybe it's the way you listen. Wake him up. See, that's the kind of stuff you have to deal with. If somebody asks a question, and then you come back with a snappy reply, and by the time you can get it out, they're back asleep. And again, I'm being nice by you know, pointing out here like I'm talking about something else rather than inside of one what? Boxcar, no. Room, no. Person, close, Bunky. Real close, real close. Close enough. What if there is a place where you could almost start all over and where there would be some validity not the words, because the words, I'll grant you, are just nut city. That there'd be a way in which you could think, and you had, I hate to say it again. In fact, it's even sillier that way. That you could think in a way that would not be this way, that your thoughts were leading in some direction. That was no improvement at all. But what if that were true? that you understood in your own way that although the ability to reach conclusions without any doubt spell ordinary, reasonable, sane success in the intellectual world of the city, in the secondary world of ordinary thought, that although the ability to reach conclusions, to even strive in the proper direction, to try and come up with a mathematical answer to the question of what is two and two, to even do that is the very patina of success. And yet, 
simultaneously. From another view, the reaching, the inability to reach actual conclusions. That is, that it is a patina. Well, yes, four is the answer to that. Well, yes and no. But four is the answer. But to understand that, wait a minute, that is simply the glow. That is simply a kind of rustoleum that's covered up two and two is three and two and two is five and two and two are sweet peas. If you could think in a way that that did not enter into it and you can't force the way you're thinking into another rut, into another area, in polarized thought, it would have to be in a whole new virgin place to wherein there were no opposition, there was no support for what you were doing. It would only be in a place that you could describe that if you were thinking in the question of is leading somewhere, that you had some idea in what direction it was headed, that it should be headed, if you were doing otherwise, then it's not just a matter that you are avoiding sham, specious, spurious conclusions, which are non-conclusions. It's not that you're just avoiding running headlong forever toward this tunnel, which never ends, but it's along the way that you're no longer tied to the apparent opposition and support of whatever's happening as you would head toward these non-conclusions. <clears throat> well. Try it again. The setup you recall to this paragraph was if you can if you have some notion about where you're thinking about anything where your thinking is headed, it's headed nowhere. In the revolutionist sense, in a subversive sense, in an ordinary sense, assuming you're just sane and ordinary, it would be headed in a proper direction. It's headed towards some conclusion, whether you get there or not. At least it's headed toward a conclusion. They're trying to re use reason and logic and everything else. And your mama's recipe for yams. <laughs> but you're headed in a direction that you would not be thinking. You would not be trying to go somewhere if you had nowhere to go. And so you're headed somewhere. The alternative to that, which has no reasonable description, is what we're saying about being able to think in such a way that you are not caught by the illusion that there is a conclusion, which there's not, other than death, other than the end of the subject, other than case closed. But it is the lack of real conclusions in the sense that humans finally discover the truth about this, and that, and finally they tie the whole thing up. They tied the whole thing up. They can forget worrying about the proliferation again of atomic weapons. Their neurons will blow themselves up. That is, it's suicide here. Not necessarily physically, but intellectually it would be that the human intellect had become the dinosaurs of contemporary times and they would get extincted. They would disappear and later people would come along if there were other people and wonder, what happened to the dinosaurs and human intellect? It all go down if I know. It'd just simply be gone. So there is no such thing as real conclusions. If you were thinking in such a way that you weren't even caught in that, which I agree one more time is insane. It will not compute at the ordinary level. But if you could, it would not be simply some trap some attempt to avoid falling into this apparent trap of conclusions or seeking that which does not exist. It's not just that. Because if that were true, there'd be a one-shot deal that you'd be cured. It's not being trapped. It's not being enticed. It's not being seduced along the way by any notion of Salome over here on the right of you or to the left of you, that is, that, well, wait a minute, there is some support for this thought. There are people, there are ideas, even my own and other people's. Ha-ha, <laughs> wait till I quote so-and-so that supports what I'm doing. And another way, of course, to know you're on the right track is to be able to adjust and to judge your movements along the path, this neural path, by looking around, which you know, requires no effort at all, at all the idiots and fools around you who hold conflicting views. That's the best part. 
That's the main part. Not simply that you are in some way have given up the illusion that you're going to arrive in the city of Troy, which is not there anyway. But it's along the way that the waves may toss me to and fro. I may meet those who are against me and I may meet those who are for me. What if it was something else? How much time we got? How much real time we got? Two minutes? Two minutes, all right. Then how about this? We'll wrap it up even stranger. How about this? Instead of, as we've been doing, calling this kind of attempted thinking process, and of course the kind of person that might be such an instrument, such a medium for it that we call revolutionist and subversive and all that. What if we call that kind of person and that kind of ability, but let's make it personally since I bet most of you like to make it personally. Would you raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> if we called, we could call it a freelancer. A freelancer. Consider a person that had no ordinary ties. Just had no ordinary intellectual, emotional, political, religious, personal. Ties with anything, and by things I, the things I just mentioned, with any ordinary political institution, any religious ideas, any, any of the very things that define through the environment of making the outline, instead of looking at you being the fish, we subtract you in the space that would have been water is now empty and we see the outline of what you were. No ties, no ties to the environment, the ordinary environment. No ties to ordinary politics, religion, race, nationality, class. A freelancer. But what would that really be saying? It's not that there's anything wrong with religion and nationality and politics and all blah, blah, blah. It's not that. But what does that actually reflect from a more subversive, a more complex view outside the general run of city thought? What it reflects by being tied to any of that, what it does reflect operationally is a strain, is a strain on the very molecular glue that holds together the, ge the genetic grid work and background in which we live. With ordinary people, there's supposed to be such a strain because that helps produce growth. It is the exercise of muscle in a metaphorical and symbolic sense. But to someone attempting to do something outside the ordinary gym, where all they do is tell you not to spit in the floor or pee in the sink, if you're trying to do something yourself, you cannot be tolerating that kind of strain because you're putting a strain between you and the complete environment, not your psychological environment, not between you and your imaginary relationship to your nation's God or your race's God or your family's God or morality, you're putting a strain, if you're trying to do something extraordinary, you're putting a strain on the actual molecular structure that glues together the background for everybody, the genetic background on which we live, on which we are played out, in which this film of us is shown. But of course, ordinarily, that's to be a person of great convictions, strong beliefs, sometimes even passing for intelligence. In another world, I'll tell you what it passes for. Oh, I forgot. They have a code. I can't tell you. Oh, we're going to casually fade out.